Hello, and welcome back to 4 of a Kind Cartoons. Today, we'll be tackling the serious topic of injustice and looking at four ways that it can manifest itself. For the majority of us, our brains have developed a few core rules of what's right and wrong. But some of us may have not developed this, haven't had the time to do so, or just don't care. And although culturally, these wrongs may vary to some degree, generally, they all revolve around some of the same structures. For instance, we generally feel that an act done to someone or something that causes harm is wrong. Whether the harm is physical, emotional, or psychological can be a factor as well. We usually feel there's another degree of wrong when the person harmed is completely innocent. For me personally, witnessing the act secondhand feels no better, as a wave of guilt sets in from knowing that a fellow human would treat another person or thing in such a terrible manner. That's why, in this episode of Four of a Kind Cartoons, I'll be breaking down four episodes that elicit a feeling of hopelessness in humanity. Here we go. Let's start our journey off with the Hey Arnold episode, Pigeon Man. We start with Arnold training some pet pigeons on the roof of the boarding house. They were possibly feral at one point, but it's never really specified. Either way, Arnold shows a fascination for them, even choosing to name them. He's trained them to be carrier pigeons, and sends his pigeon named Chester to deliver a message to Gerald to come hang out. Chester takes flight, but something seems very off about him. Later, at the stoop of the boarding house, all the neighborhood kids are hanging out, but Gerald hasn't arrived. He eventually meets the kids, but alerts Arnold that there seems to be something seriously wrong with Chester. The valiant bird falls from the sky, demonstrating the severity of his health issue. I also noticed that it looks like the note attached to his leg is still there, meaning he never actually made it to Gerald's house. In a panic, Arnold is trying to figure out what to do about his sick bird. Sid suggests for Arnold to take Chester to the Pigeon Man, a man who lives in an abandoned building in the pet shop district. Gerald goes into detail, describing him as a dark figure who's half man, half bird, and was hatched from an egg and left by aliens. The neighborhood kids have all come to the conclusion that Pigeon Man is a psycho that everyone is somewhat afraid of but unanimously shunning. He is the neighborhood outcast, much like Stoop Kid, but unlike Stoop Kid in his really aggressive nature, there seems not to be a justifiable reason for his treatment. Arnold, being the kind-hearted person that he is, puts his pigeon's life over the opinions of his friends and takes Chester to visit Pigeon Man. At the abandoned building, Arnold goes to the top of the roof and hands over his pigeon without saying many words. There was no small talk, just a common goal of getting the bird some help. So Arnold leaves Chester with Pigeon Man with the goal of returning tomorrow to pick him up. He heads back to the boarding house where all the kids are intrigued yet still antagonistic towards Pigeon Man. Arnold explains that he's not a bad person and he's actually a pretty nice guy. The next day, Arnold goes to pick up Chester who's been completely rehabbed by Pigeon Man. Arnold and Pigeon Man get to talking and Arnold realizes that he has things in common with him. They went to the same school, grew up in the same neighborhood, and they both love birds. Only, Pigeon Man's age allows him to go into more detail about his life journey. His love of birds started at a young age, much like Arnold's. He loved them so much that he'd do reports on them in school. But his outward love and fascination with birds was a social stigma for him, as it's what he names as the reason for his friends finding him weird, causing them to reject him for the rest of his life. Arnold sees Pigeon Man as a person and invites him to get some pizza. The two of them are having a great time connecting. But while they're away, Stinky and Harold have the idea to go and vandalize the pigeon coop at the abandoned building as a way to further antagonize Pigeon Man. They start destroying everything, completely wrecking this man's sanctuary. Later, Arnold and Pigeon Man make it back to the abandoned building to find the desecrated remains of the coops and supplies. This is awful! Who did this? People, Arnold. Arnold, being Arnold, offers to help him rebuild everything. But Pigeon Man declines and instead decides to leave the city, the place he's lived since a young child. He plans to leave to help pigeons in other places, maybe another part of the city or a different state entirely. Either way, he's leaving all of what he's built behind. Hopefully, it's in an area where the people understand him better, as Arnold's neighborhood was not able to. This was truly a depressing episode. In a lot of ways, Arnold is just like Pigeon Man, even to the point of his friend's inability to understand his fascination with carrier pigeons. Arnold was able to see Pigeon Man for the person he was, instead of the exaggerated idea that was told to him. I think that's due to Arnold being Arnold, and the fact that Arnold doesn't see pigeons as an oddity, so for him, that's not a barrier. 
However, in society we often do see people who are heavy into niche hobbies or facets of life as strange. We even give them names that come with a stigma, such as crazy cat lady. Maybe not always intentionally, but at times we can end up excluding these types of people instead of embracing them. Which is what happened to Pigeon Man as a child. And that sucks, because Pigeon Man seems to be a really bright individual. He cared for lost, broken, and sick birds, giving them so much love and attention. As a child, if he was given that love and support from his community, he may have been on the path to become an avian veterinarian, but instead he was outcasted. The real antagonists in this episode were just some elementary school kids who likely have an idea of what's right and wrong, but don't have it in themselves to be responsible enough to follow those ideals. Always wash your berries before you eat them and fly toward the sun. Next up, a show that you probably haven't seen in a while, The Wild Thornberries. We'll be going over the episode, The Origin of Donnie. This is a four part episode that opens up season four, so I'm gonna give you guys the distilled version. The episode starts with the Thornberries getting ready to celebrate a special day while in Borneo for a nature shoot. That special day is the anniversary of when they found Donnie in the jungles of Borneo. The Thornberries have no clue where Donnie came from or where his parents are. So for the anniversary, Nigel invites his wife, Marianne's mother, to come help celebrate. Marianne and her mother have an ongoing standoff which leads Marianne to have her daughters Debbie and Eliza stay behind to clean up the RV before her mother arrives. Leaving Marianne and Nigel time to visit the Orangutan Rehabilitation Center in the area. While there, they film for a documentary giving us a lot of information about the effects of poaching on orangutan populations. Bits of information like poachers killing mother orangutans and selling the babies as exotic pets. Then, when the orangutans get too big to care for, they're abandoned in the wild where they'll likely die from not having the skills necessary to survive, as they aren't very instinctual, much like human children. Somewhere else in the jungles of Borneo, Eliza, Darwin, and Donnie are out exploring and looking for orangutans. They come across a variety of animals like rhinos and proboscis monkeys. They all seem to have an aversion or even hatred towards humans as poaching has affected them so heavily. These poachers have brought a spectrum of problems to their community, from harassment to death. Eventually, Donnie ends up disappearing into the jungle, causing Eliza to go searching for him. As Donnie terrorizes the creatures of the jungle, he comes across two very friendly orangutans that decide this kid's not half bad and end up taking him in. Soon after, Debbie and Grandma start their search for the entire family as they've been gone longer than expected. They end up in a pitfall and get rescued by a local tribe. Back in the jungle, night falls and a storm is brewing, leaving Eliza to spend the night in a tree with a baby orangutan that she rescued. She wakes up to find a fire has started in the jungle, leading her to head towards the river for safety. On the way there, she runs into all the animals who have lost faith in humanity due to poaching, causing a huge issue of mistrust. She struggles to lead them to safety as they believe she's trying to trap them. Eventually, she's able to persuade them to follow her. At the river, Eliza calls to the mother of the baby orangutan that she's rescued, causing her to come find them. The mother orangutan tells Eliza about Donnie's parents and then she remembers seeing them a long time ago. She tells them where Donnie's likely headed, which is a nearby village where his parents often visited. She tells them about a large tree as a waypoint. At the tree, all of the thornberries reunite to continue the search for Donnie. They see him in the distance, but just as they approach, he's swooped away by orangutans. They continue their pursuit and end up at the local village. Here, they meet the orangutans that have been hanging out with Donnie and the local medicine woman, Juanice. But Donnie's parents are nowhere to be found. Wani sits the thornberries down and tells them the earth-shattering news of what happened to Donnie's parents. Donnie's parents were scientists who were studying in Borneo. They were friends of the village and became very close friends with the two orangutans, a mother and a baby. The same ones that have been hanging out with Donnie. They spent so much time with them that they taught them sign language. Unfortunately, one night, poachers came to kill the mother orangutan to steal the baby. Donnie's parents fought the poachers, allowing the mother and her baby to escape. However, they did this at the cost of their life, as the poachers ended up killing them. At the funeral, Donnie reunites with the orangutans and goes on to live with them, until the thornberries come to Borneo for their very first visit. The wild thornberries was so good at highlighting issues surrounding nature and the ways humans interact with it. Donnie and his family are fictional people, but the sentiment around the immoral actions of poachers is very real. They kill rhinos and elephants to collect the horns and ivory killing rare and endangered animals as trophies and collector items. And every year, nearly 100 rangers are killed by poachers while attempting to protect the animals, just like Donnie's parents. 
This episode used the baby orangutan rescued by Eliza as a way to showcase just how helpless these babies are. Their development is not too different than humans. Unlike a baby deer who can probably survive alone at 3 or 4 months, a baby orangutan needs years to develop and learn how to fend for itself. Without their mother there for them, they will die. Guys, please wipe your tears, because up next we have Avatar The Last Airbender, The Southern Air Temple. Aang and the gang have just set off on the journey to master all four elements and stop the Fire Nation. Their first stop is the Southern Air Temple. Here he plans to see his old friends and teacher, Monk Yatso. Katara and Sokka fear that things may have changed due to the Fire Nation and how long Aang has been gone. However, Aang is optimistic that the Southern Air Temple is an unreachable fortress. The temple is atop the tallest mountain, where only an airbender with the ability to glide could make it there. However, as they approach the temple on Appa, they soon realize that things are different than when Aang was living there. The temple is void of people and life. Eventually, Katara and Sokka find a Fire Nation helmet that's been damaged, hinting at an altercation. Instead of letting Aang know, they hide this from him in an attempt to keep him from what's likely happened here. The team head to a statue of Monk Yatso, triggering a flashback of when Aang was given life lessons from Yatso. He was told of a being inside the monk's sanctuary who will one day guide Aang on his journey. Back in reality, Aang enters the sanctuary and meets Avatar Roku's statue, the avatar before him. He also meets Momo, the flying lemur, so I guess they both get to guide Aang on his journey. While chasing Momo, Aang comes across firebender relics of war and the skeleton of his once friend, guardian, and mentor, Gyatso. The sudden realization that the Fire Nation has wiped out everyone he's loved triggers Aang's avatar state. He starts destroying the structure where Monk Gyatso took his last breath. It isn't until Katara extends a shoulder to cry on, relating to Aang's pain of loss through her own loss of her mother, that Aang actually starts to calm down. Then, there they stand three individuals whose lives were forever changed by the Fire Nation. The theme in this episode is multi-layered and here's why. The Fire Nation destroying the Air Nation is the literal definition of genocide. Not only did they do this, but they had to create a whole new method of transportation just to kill them. To top it all off, their end goal in doing this was to command over nature in the natural order. They thought that if they could kill all the airbenders, they could break the Avatar cycle for good, leaving no other threat to their path of destruction. All of that paints such a bleak landscape of what life was like for anyone who wasn't Fire Nation. Imagine living in peace atop a serene mountain with a community that loves you, for all of that to be swept away in a matter of hours. That means they found the other ones too. I really am the last airbender. And finally, making their way back to the stage, we have Hey Arnold in Arnold's Christmas. I normally would choose four completely different shows in addition to the episodes, but I felt that this episode had to be on this list, so I made an exception. The episode starts off a couple days before Christmas. Kids all around the neighborhood are excited about various aspects of the holiday, with some having selfish desires and others very caring in nature. A big note in this one is that Helga, along with all the other girls in the city, want these signature Spumoni snow boots for Christmas. But along with what Helga wants, she's desperately trying to come up with a gift idea for Arnold. I don't think she ever planned to hand it to him directly, just slip it to him as a completely secret, secret Santa, which is pretty sweet. Back at the boarding house, the tenants are doing a Secret Santa event and everyone's picking who they'll be getting a gift for this year. Oscar stuffs the fishbowl with all of his own name so that everyone buys him a present, but that plan quickly fails. He alone could justify me giving up on humanity, but that's for another video. After the name selection gets back on track, Arnold ends up selecting Mr. Wynn who up to this point in the series has been a very introverted tenant of the boarding house. He's shown here to be very in his head and secluded, and it's said that he's always like this during the holidays. So Arnold, not knowing much about him, starts the mission of figuring out what Mr. Wynn wants for Christmas. He begins by probing about small things like candy or sweaters, but eventually gets to the topic of Mr. Wynn's relationship with the holiday season. Mr. Wynn goes into detail about the war-torn country of Vietnam that he once lived in. He tells the story about the fighting between North and South Vietnam, getting closer and closer to his home in the South. They show images of soldiers, tanks, and helicopters marching through his town at night while his daughter sleeps, burning buildings and chaos all around him. The choice he faced while living in Vietnam was to either stay in his home with his infant child and possibly one day be starved out or attacked or take her to the US Embassy in Vietnam so they could take his daughter out of the war zone and into a safer place. 
Mr. Wynn chose the latter and his daughter was taken away by helicopter while he was left behind. But before leaving, the soldier aboard the helicopter told him the city where they were taking her. So for the next 20 years of Mr. Wynn's life, he stayed in the war zone of Vietnam. Then finally, one day, he was able to make it out of his country and moved to the United States to find her. So Arnold sees finding Mr. Wynn's daughter and reuniting them as the ultimate Christmas gift. He goes on a long journey of bargaining and begging to try to get a government employee to use his resources to find Mr. Wynn's daughter. He's cut a deal to do the employee's last minute Christmas shopping in exchange for the missing person search. He eventually fails when he can't get the Spumoni snow boots that are sold out citywide. So Arnold ends up at Secret Santa Christmas Day with no gift for Mr. Wynn. But by the miracle of Helga G. Pataki giving up her own Spumoni boots and working endlessly overnight with the government employee, Mr. Wynn gets a gift. And it's Mr. Wynn's daughter, Mai. And they finally get to reunite after 20 long years filled with pain, suffering, and longing. Although the ending was positive, one reunion after 20 years could never make up for the time lost between the two of them. Mr. Wynn and Mai's story is just one of many in the very real topic of the Vietnam War. And actually, the voice actor of Mr. Wynn, Bowen Coleman, was a refugee of Vietnam, giving so much more realism and pain to this story. I don't want to step into the politics of the Vietnam War, as that's not my specialty. And I also don't want to be so absolute in saying there is no justifiable reason to ever fight. However, I do feel that the invasion of civilian areas and the disregard and neglect for the people that inhabit them is something that will always give me a feeling of secondhand shame for humanity. We've tackled a gauntlet of topics ranging from bullying to poaching all the way to genocide and a possible war crime. So far, I'm loving how this series is coming along because it's really giving me new perspectives and allowing me to see just how unique specific topics can be in cartoons. If you need a palate cleanser after watching such a series video, why not check out this video here. As always, if you made it this far, take the time to drop a like and subscribe. Also, turn on notifications so that you can be alerted whenever I put out new content. Your support helps the channel grow and keeps you up to date on my videos. I also created a Patreon. I'll be giving away early access as well as some behind the scenes content. Until next time, see ya.